Hey, good morning. It's good to see you all. I'm so glad you're here. If you're a guest, I'd love to meet you today. I've already met some who are brand new today. And if you are new, you're not alone and you're welcome here. So good to see you. Hey, we kick into Passion uh, Week or so, Palm Sunday next week, but we're getting close to Easter. And so now is really the time. If you haven't been able to do this, to really focus your hearts on Him. I want to challenge you over the next couple of weeks to do what I'm going to do. Read the Passion narratives, we call them. Pati in Latin means suffer, to suffer or endure. The Passion of Christ, you've heard that. Um, it, it's in the, the final, really, third of the Gospels, really about a third of the Gospels are the final week of Jesus' life. His passion uh, is kind of that last week. And I want, you, I want to encourage you to do that. Read all the passion narratives, which are in each of the Gospels. They're easy to find. Today, we're going to get there. Um, we're actually going to be in the week of as we move towards Easter. Now's the time to really set our hearts on him. Always is the time. Uh, not I, but Christ who, who lives in me. If we've not met, um, and again, I'd love to meet you, but you might uh, recognize a couple things about me without even knowing me. One thing you'd know, if you looked hard enough, is that I'm married, right? I wear a wedding ring. Now I can take this off and say, I'm, well, I'm still married. I'm still married. Um, so you can say, yeah, that's just a ring. No, 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 no. Not just a ring. This is a wedding ring, right? It, it reflects a deep commitment and passion that I have for my wife, Stacy. a commitment I've made to her when I said I do for life. Um, if you were to find this ring, by the way, and I've, I have lost it before, but if you were to find it, um, you would be like, wow, you might know that's a, well, that's a wedding ring. Dang, somebody lost a wedding ring. And then you could sell it for, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars or something. I don't know, 50 bucks. I don't know what you might get for it. But my point is this, some things have intrinsic value, others things, you know, extrinsic value. This ring m means a lot to me. My valuation of the ring would be different from yours, right? A lot of you know that um, the, the housing market here in Dallas is on fire. Anybody bought a home over, the, say, the past year or so? Anybody moved? Yeah, blessings on you all. Because that is a crazy process right now. I've been, uh, I was reading that over the past year alone, the price of a single uh, home has has uh, skyrocketed like 17, 20 percent in, in some cases, 78 percent over the fa past five years, um, and and so the valuation of homes uh, are on on the rise. I, I heard of a, a couple, a young couple that was getting a um, a house, and like everybody else, trying to get you know get it quick because got to move fast. They they bought this house without uh, an appraisal, without a proper uh, evaluation of the house, and um, without an inspection. So they bought the house, yeah. They bought the house and it was a mess. Like lots of money had to go into it because if you're gonna invest in something, you better get the valuation of this thing right. Today, we're going to look at and consider, may sound strange, valuation, okay? The worth that we would place on Jesus. Like what is he worth? What is he worth? And how would you answer that question? And how would you know if what you say and understand in the context of a worship service and hearing God's word preached and singing about the Lord, not I, but you, Lord, we love you and we thank you for all you've done, all the good stuff. I mean, we're in a moment where we're like, yes. And this is why corporate worship is so critical for us is we're reminded we come together and, and as Han noted, we do this as a family. We do this together. And you've already, like me, been encouraged. Like, man, I come together. I love, I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, the pastor, you're the pastor. But I love our church family. I'm talking about you, people. And I love being together. And I love worshiping the Lord with you. And I'm just energized and I'm strengthened. And I think I can face the week ahead, you know, and hang on to what we do here. Because we place ultimate value and worth on Jesus. So you can go ahead and grab your Bible. We're going to be in Matthew 26. We're jumping uh, to the latter part of uh, the passage that um, Han just read. We're now into the week of, of uh, Christ heading to the cross. And we're going to go back. Uh, next week is Palm Sunday. We're going to, that's the Sunday before, right? He, he's um, on the cross. And then um, we're going to go back even further after Easter. We're staying in Matthew and we're going to look at uh, some teachings of Jesus. Today, as we've talked about the coronation of the king, we started with the genealogy of the king, coronation of the king, his baptism, uh, the transfiguration, the glory of the king last week. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the anointing of the king, all right? The anointing of the king. And I don't know if you know this story, but this story is amazing. 
Um, and it's all in the backdrop. This is what's cool about and, and sovereign and providential. The entire story of Jesus now coming to Jerusalem one last time, and he ends up, you know, getting uh, arrested, beaten almost to the point of death, dying on the cross, then his resurrection. All of this is in the, with the backdrop of the Passover going on. If you know anything about the Passover, th this is the feast of the unleavened bread. And it's hearkening back. It's the moment on the Jewish calendar, and it was here. All of Jerusalem would have been packed with people now from all around the region, all around the country. And they're coming there. Even the suburbs now starting to get filled up with people who are coming because the temple was there. And you would come, and you would experience Passover together. Looking back at the story, their great story of Exodus and salvation, right? Out of Egypt as slaves and, and the Passover meal told the story. Our Jewish friends are going to do that real soon. So uh, they would then, you know, they would take the blood of the lamb during this time, a perfect lamb without blemish. And what they did, they were told to place the blood over the doorpost, right? So, that, so the angel of death would pass over them, all right? So salvation would come to those who had the shed blood covering them. Jesus now steps on the scene, and right in the middle of this, with that as the backdrop, he's heading to the cross. And what I want to see in this passage is um, three valuations placed on Jesus. Uh, kind of see appraisals, opinions, what he's worth, how much we might spend, if you will, on him. We're going to look at three valuations. The first one we're going to look at is the valuation by the leaders, all right? I'm going to just walk us through this text. And by the way, we find here a story. Mark does this a lot in his gospel. Matthew does it called a sandwich, sandwich technique where the storyline is going along and then bam, here comes this little story inside a story that actually helps interpret, tells you what's going on. That's what's happening here. What is happening here? And you're going to see in this story, it's like, whoa, and then it gets back to the timeline. Um, but this is right in the middle of the timeline. First, we're going to see the valuation of the leaders. Then we're going to see the valuation of, of Mary. This is Mary of Bethany. And then you're going to see the valuation of the disciples. And we're going to find ourselves here. Okay, so if you take notes on sermons, you've got your bulletin there where you can do so, or you have a journal like me, I love to just take notes and then come back to. By the way, you can find a QR code there as well that'll take you to our sermon resource, sermon response guide for you to dive deeper. We're doing everything we can to help you walk with Jesus every day, get underneath his word and the, and the word preached here in this place. All right, Matthew 26, we're gonna start with verse one. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, so there's a lot of teaching in chapter 25. He actually ends with a well-known teaching where he says, hey, when you've done it unto the least of these, this is important for our context, um, you've done it unto me. When you've cared for the poor, when you've helped people who are, who are, who are sick or imprisoned, people who are, in our case who are, who are homebound, when, when people are in need and you help them, you're actually doing it unto me. It's like that's a way of, of worshiping, showing worth, to me. And then he says, so after he finishes saying these things, verse two, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the son of man will be delivered up to be crucified. How clear is this, by the way? Now on the backside, we look back and go, well, yeah, of course he was crucified. And he's telling them, but they almost no one really grasped this. Like, why is this happening? Often things he would say, you'll know this afterward. You'll understand later. Then the chief priest and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth, okay, take him secretly and kill him. And, and they said, well, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So this is a, the summary. This is the summary of the backstory. He's gotten in the way of their old way. He's got a new way. And oftentimes among people, uh, pretentious people who've got it all together, particularly religious types, there is an un, unmovable, kind of you know, unshakable hold onto the way. Jesus is really disrupting things. And I would say it this way. Their valuation of Jesus was that he was worthless. Worthless. Because when it came to their system, their religious system of righteousness, Jesus had no place. In fact, they're threatened by him. Uh, when I was a pastor in, in McKinney, 
uh, we did one night, we had a panel of religious leaders on the platform and I was asking them questions. And the point of the whole thing was let's learn more about what other religions believe with greater understanding and a greater empathy and love for them. Uh, but also I wanted to, everybody to know, people who say, well, you know, all religious religions basically teach the same thing. Like you probably heard that. Like all, all roads lead to God. It's pretty much the same. No, they're not. And so we had a Buddhist up there, okay, that you can hardly grasp. Like, oh, I don't even understand. Not unlike a Hindu who was there. We had, a, we had a, an imam. We had a Muslim imam. And I had a rabbi up there. And I'll never forget. Oh, so we had a Q&A afterwards. And our, our congregation were asking questions. And we were asking, well, where does, uh, someone asked the rabbi, where does Jesus come into play? Like, you know, we, we both, we read the Old Testament and we, we kind of know some of the same stories. Where does Jesus fit in your understanding of God and your theology? And he said, kindly, Jesus doesn't fit in my theology at all. Like there's no, he's not even in the equation. And now you might guess that for a Jewish person, or maybe a Jewish person would say, well, you know, he probably lived, but he was just a good teacher. He wasn't like the Messiah. We're still waiting on the Messiah. In other words, in your theological framework and understanding, he's worthless. He's of no value to you at all. Now, those of us who who worship Jesus and he's saved us and he's rescued us. We hear that and go, Jesus, worthless. What? Can't be the case. And yet, you know people who, who are Jesus not in the equation. He's not thought about. He's not considered. He's certainly not worshiped. There could be times where we live that way. I mean, even as his father, we could forget and live a day or make decisions and he's his teaching or anything that he might got is worthless. We've just set him aside for a moment. I was reminded of um, C.S. Lewis's great trilemma. He made it popular. It was actually John Duncan, was a Scottish pastor in 1859, who came up with this trilemma, kind of an apologetic, a defense. He said, Jesus is either, do y'all know this? He said, he's either a liar or he's a lunatic or he's Lord. And the whole thing plays out where if you eliminate one of the options, you've got two left. If you eliminate two, you have one option. There's only three. And, and, and C.S. Lewis ran with this even further. But, but it's to say, Jesus said he was God and he was the son of man, the Messiah. But he was lying. Okay? He's a liar. Or he said he was God. He knew he wasn't. He's crazy. Now, you've got to put his whole life into play, right? If you're going to take on one of those two, you got to one, you got to, okay, what about the miracles? What about the, uh, there's a resurrection. There's a church that's birth. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff we could go there. Um, but you're only left with the fact he's Lord. And then C.S. Lewis, he says this, for those who, who then say, well, he's just like a good moral teacher is what he is. I mean, he's like, a, you know, like any other religious leader that came down the pike. C.S. Lewis notes, he did not leave us that option. He did not intend to. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And he's a liar, he's a lunatic. And here though, he's not just worthless, you could argue. No, he's a threat. They want to eliminate him because oftentimes among, and we're gonna see this with the disciples even, among pretentious people, Jesus becomes a threat. In fact, he becomes strange. And what I want you to see here is that the, the priest and the elders considered him blasphemous. They needed him out. They disregarded him completely. Now, look at this next evaluation or valuation, the valuation of Mary. The, the valuation by Mary, uh, we're going to see something very different. You may know this story. This is a great story. And so let's look at uh, verse 6, okay? Now, when Jesus was at Bethany... In the house of Simon the leper, a woman, John, by the way, John 12, Mark also writes about this. So I'll, there's commentary that's not here in Matthew. Mary came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. So catch the picture. Uh, they're in Bethany. This is, this is where Mary, Mary lived here. Um, Martha, her sister, Lazarus, they all lived here. John tells us that Lazarus and Mary, Martha are actually here. And guess what Martha's doing? Anybody guess? She's making dinner. She's fixing a meal again. She's always serving, always fixing, uh, helping people, serving people. And this would have been kind of the man's space, all right? 
um, sorry gals, but this is what makes Mary, she's somewhere in the mix. There's other women there perhaps. Some noted, there's, you got the disciples, it'd be 12, 17, 20 people there in this, in this little house. And by the way, this is Bethany, which literally means house of suffering. And, and with all that's happening in Jerusalem, Jesus finds himself out about six miles out in this little hamlet, little village called Bethany with a group of friends having a meal. That's where our king shows up. That's where he is. And consider who's around the table. It says that the house of Simon, the former leper, or they wouldn't have been with him, right? Presumably healed by Jesus. And then you have Lazarus. You got Mary, others, the disciples who are like, this, he's the man with all that they understood or didn't understand. Imagine the conversation around the table. Simon's like, I had leprosy, man, and he just, oh my gosh, he healed me. I mean, my life was a mess. And Lazarus, he's just letting that play out a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, I could see him dipping into the hummus. I was dead. <laughs> I was dead. He could trump any conversation, right? Anybody. And so they're just, man, all of them are like, Jesus is the one, and He's incredible and he changed my life. And then Mary steps into this and, and she then is going to show us what it is to worship him. This is just an amazing, I love this story. The other night, um, it was last Sunday night, Stacy and I were in the home of uh, new members in our church, a couple that hosted a group, um, our, our connect group is uh, having these small dinner groups. Some of y'all do this just to get to know each other better. And I was reminded again, a, a, a setting like this is an incredible place and a beautiful place to worship Jesus. Because we're in this home with, with our friends and we're talking and, and the conversation goes to Jesus, right? As believers and we're just eating and sharing and encouraging each other in the Lord. But the, this, is, this is such a simple and profound way to worship the Lord. Don't miss that. When we come together, we see it throughout scripture. We come together together. We talk about Jesus, we, we experience the common grace of good food and good drink and all the good conversation, and we worship him. When's the last time you host some people in your home with the intention of getting to know each other better and worship Jesus in the midst of it all? You know, worship is not just coming together and singing songs, right? It's all the time, anytime. And then Mary steps in and she disrupts this entire thing. Where she brings this alabaster jar. Again, we know more about this than is here in Matthew. And it's with this, um, it's called spikenard. Is this perfume that's real expensive. In fact, John tells us it's, it's, it's worth a year's wage is what she's got in this flask. Uh, a, a pound of it, 16 ounces. Think about that. Most of y'all get your little latte 12 ounce. This is a 16, was this venti? I mean, this is venti perfume is what she's got going on. That's a lot of perfume, which is why she pours it over his head and his hair, his beard. It goes all over him, which is why it ends up on his feet. Or another gospel writer, she's down on the feet. Like it's all over him. She pours this whole thing, this semi-transparent, costly flask. Um, and then this this spike nard, this perfume, strong perfume that comes from the Himalayan mountains. This is expensive stuff from a plant out in the Himalayan mountains somewhere. A whole year's wage. Now it begs the question, what is she doing with this? Like, is she carrying this around? I mean, like she just, just kind of like, you know, like all the time. No. She knew Jesus was going to be here. This is her neighborhood. She knew Jesus was coming. She's going to see him again. And she wants to be there. She has been transformed by him. She wants to express her love. This love gush of Mary's was not spontaneous. This was not like, hey, whoop, I got some perfume. She brought this for the moment and she breaks into, this is awkward. I mean, right? Like this is like, what? What's going on here? This is strange. She can't contain herself. She steps into the man space and she says, I'm going to worship him with the very most expensive thing I have I'm going to bring to him. Like we think, this is odd. What is she doing here? She said, I'm just going to bring the most expensive thing I have. But we're going to see that there's more to the story. What she's doing here is grounded in substance, context, and her own personal experience with Jesus. 
So this is not just some, some crazy act. In fact, I would say it this way. Her valuation of Jesus was this. He's worthy. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of everything and the very best I can bring to him. Now, begs the question, do you bring your best to him in worship? And I think all of it, if we're honest, all of us are like, I want to, but I don't, best? I don't know if I've ever brought my best. I want to. And some of you here today even, you're thinking, Jeff, my life is, I'm just coming, I'm hanging on a thread. I'm just broken is what I am. And we're all broken in varying degrees. If you feel broken, like you can't bring your best, bring your brokenness. The point is you're bringing your best, bring your best, whatever that is. And a broken and contrite spirit, he will not despise. He says, come. I know you're not perfect. That's why I died for you. That's why my grace is one way love. I know you can't bring your best always. So you, you just come, come to me and that'll be enough. But here she is bringing the most expensive thing that she has. Now think about this, even in terms of, of giving time and resource and, and, and such to the Lord or your money to the Lord. Often we would say, hey, you know, it's not the amount maybe that, that matters. It's really what's in your heart. It's in your heart. Yes, it starts with the heart, but think about it. If Mary hadn't brought this expensive gift to Jesus, we wouldn't be telling this story. I mean, she came and brought a little something. Here's a little something. I love you, Jesus. Here's a little something. And a lot of us literally, can I say it? We give that way. Here's a little something. You changed my life. Here's a little something. It's Sunday morning. Nah, we can get there late, no big deal. It's Sunday morning. Let's be prepared to worship him. We get to come like her. Be ready to bring our best to him. How often do you approach Sunday that way? How many of you think it's Sunday night how you get ready? I mean, Saturday night how you can get ready for Sunday? How many of you want to give everything you've got in the small amount of time that we have on a Sunday morning? Do you come prepared? Do you come giving all that you have? Oswald Chambers said it this way. He said, worship is giving the best that God has given to you back to him. The best you have in everything that you do. Everything in our lives is an act of worship. So what we see here, then the story goes on as, as the disciples then are rather... We're going to see upset by this. So watch the, the, the valuation of the disciples next in verses 8 and 9. Here it is, verse 8. Look at this. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant. And John is the one who tells us Judas is now the spokesperson for them. Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. Hmm. Now you could say, that's, a, that's legit. Like, Really? Like she poured it out all in that moment, in that instance. But the word here, they're indignant. The word is furious, like super angry, like steaming mad. And John 12 tells us that Judas is the one who's saying it. And then John offers a little commentary. John does this. He kind of throws shade at the other disciples. You ever notice that? Like he outran Peter to the tomb a time. And here... He says, hey, Judas didn't give a rip about the poor. In fact, he was the one who held the bag, literally. He held the bag and he would, he would take out of it. John says he was the thief. He's telling this story later. He was a thief. So Judas is really mad. That money could have been ours and a little bit could have been mine. I would say it this way. Their valuation of Jesus was that he was worthwhile. Worthwhile. Until he wasn't. Like it was a law of reciprocity. Jesus, you do this for me, I will worship you. If you don't, then, uh, then maybe not. Maybe not. So they, they were saying, well, he's, he's worthwhile. Pragmatic. And if we're, if we're honest, a lot of us approach worship that way with Jesus. How pragmatic was it that Mary pours out a year's wage right there on top of him? See, worship is not pragmatic. Worship is not, what will you do for me? It's what he's already done for us. 
It's why, like Paul, we said, we, we know nothing among you. And if you're a guest here, you need to know this. We don't know anything among you but Christ and him crucified for us, on our behalf, raised again. That's all we've got. Our message here is not humanity and it improved. It's Christ and him crucified. And, and, and this is, is what we're going to see here is the disciples don't fully understand it. I'm convinced that Mary knew what she was doing. I came into my studies, even this week, I've always thought that what's happening here, Jesus is going to offer commentary on what she's doing. And I've always thought she, so he's just explaining really. And he did, he would do this. This is what's actually happening. You don't see it, but here's what's going on. That's not what's happening here, but we'll, we'll get there in a moment. But see, I want you to see here that true spirituality, Mary's worship of God is often threatening to pretentious people. I mean, this can happen. It's like, um, hey, you worship Jesus, but don't get crazy. I mean, don't be fanatical. How, how extreme would be too extreme in terms of our worship? Well, how, can we be too fanatical? Can we be too crazy in worshiping Jesus? You say, well, yeah, I've seen some crazy stuff. And, and even, like, even in corporate gatherings of, of worship, and we all worship differently, but somebody over here, okay, worship Jesus with all you got, but don't start dancing or something. That's, that's, that's like, don't do that. Don't be pouring out every, uh, worship Jesus, but don't, don't just come weeping or something. That's a little, a little too much. Someone was telling me last week, they're saying, I was just, they're just, just weeping. They're telling me what they're going through and, and kind of embarrassed. Like, how many people around me probably don't think I'm crazy? No, 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 you're not crazy. You're like, Mary, like worshiping the Lord. Somebody getting on their knees. What's going on? That's a little distracting. I mean, corporate worship is supposed to be you know, orderly, right? But don't, don't be Judas. Don't be throwing shade at other people. You have no idea how the Lord set them free. You have, you have no idea what they've gone through this week. And then others, maybe we're not as expressive in our worship, right? And someone may have decided this week privately that they're going to take their 10% giving. They, they upped it to 15, and they're the only people who know. Or somebody in a family who's decided we're going to take a large amount of our savings, a large amount of money, and we're going to give towards the church right now. And everybody else in the family thinks you're crazy. I know of a, of a young person who grew up in our youth ministry. And she, when it came time to graduate and go to college, all of her friends doing the thing, she said, I'm not going to go to college. Not, not, not right now. I'm going to go for a year and just serve the Lord on mission. And she, you know, travels the world to go tell people about Jesus who had never heard the gospel. All of her friends headed off and did all the stuff. And then when she got a little behind, you know, them, because now they're sophomore, then she's going to be a freshman. And, you know, why is that unusual? Is that fanatical? Is that crazy? Mormons do it. You see, we, we, need to, we need to think, how can I extravagantly worship Jesus in ways that might be a little disruptive to other people? This was awkward. She didn't care. She did not care at all. In fact, look at verse 10. But Jesus, aware of, of this, okay, aware of what? Aware of, well, no, no. You, you guys are just offering some other kind of, other kind of uh, a challenge here. You, you don't care about the poor, but watch this. He said to them, he said to them, why do, you, why do you trouble the woman? I mean, why are you saying these things to her? And how offensive is it, by the way, they're going to him. Why are you pouring all this on? Why are you wasting this on Jesus? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. Look at this. What they call wasteful, he calls beautiful. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Now, some have used this to say, hey, just preach the gospel. As if there's an implications-free gospel. He's not saying, don't care about the poor. In fact, he's quoting from Deuteronomy 15, 11 that says, you're always going to have opportunity for generous action towards the poor. But right now, you got me right here in front of you. And so he says, worship me. Night cometh, worship me now. There's an urgency even about our worship. See, what was happening with the disciples, 
Judas especially, he's greedy, right? This is self-righteousness on display is what it is. And we often do this, even, you know, trying to, trying to say that my passion is more important than that passion, or we could have done this with the money, or we, well, you need to be focused on this. God's given us all passions, different, and we, lots of grace around this. Francis Bacon said it this way. He said, a bad man is a worse man when he pretends to be a good man. That's Judas. This is where the disciples are. Look at verse 12. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. And this is where I was reading this week and I thought, I've always thought that Jesus is, again, offering commentary. Y'all don't really know what's happening here, but, but here's what's going on. I'm convinced that Mary knew exactly what she was doing. She was very intentional. All of it lines up. She's got this, this certain perfume that she pours on him and she doesn't just give it a little bit. She, she pours it lavishly on him and gives up all that she's got because she knows that Jesus is about to die. She's got no more time. Look at verse 13 as we close here. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Today, it's happening. We're talking about Mary of Bethany. Friends, our worship is our witness. The way that we worship God is our witness. And so here's the question that we want to land on as we close. What is your evaluation of Jesus? When's the last time you did something in regard to worship or ministry and, and, and you might have been wondering or, or even people were like, that's crazy. That's nuts what you're doing. Ever? Has that ever happened to you? Some decision you've made, some sacrifice you've made where other people would say, what are you doing? How would you know? How would you know really what your valuation of Jesus is? Well, Matthew 6, 20, 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever you value the most in your life, your heart, your energy, your focus, your money, your conversations will run to it. What do you talk about? What makes you anxious? What makes you worry? Your deepest emotions point you to your God. You say, well, I talk about my grandkids a lot. I love my grandkids. Do you talk about Jesus? Well, I love to talk about him, man. Uh, Carolina basketball. I mean, I love talking, love talking about that. We could talk about that. Do, do you talk about Jesus? Your passion, your, your, what you value is, is expressed through your life. Now, here's what I want you to see. This is, this is amazing to me. So she pours this 16 ounces of this perfume on Jesus, and he's about to get busy. He's going to end up being arrested. He's going to be taken, beaten, suffers on our behalf so we don't have to take on the punishment for our sin. He takes it on himself. He dies on the cross for you and for me so we don't have to die. We receive by faith what he's done. He's raised again, but watch this. He's going to smell like this all the way to the cross. They didn't have showers. They didn't take showers every day. They, he couldn't have gotten this off of him anyway. And the aroma of her sacrifice and offering is going to stay on him. But here's the twist. If you want to know what you are worth to him, just look at the cross. Jesus' valuation of you is that you are worth his life. And so he dies on the cross so that you can be forgiven by faith, you could, not by works, praise God, but by faith, you receive his grace so that you can become an aroma of his grace. So when people get up close to you, I smell something. <laughs> yeah, that's the grace of God that has changed my life this week. Will he be worthless? Will he be worthwhile? Or will he be worthy? of everything you do. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that your word tells us that we've been bought with a price. You place the highest value on us when you're the one who deserves all praise, all value. 
And Lord, I pray that each of us will worship you with everything we've got. So much so that others would scratch their heads wondering why. Thank you for Mary. Thank you for her life and her gift to us all, the gift that she gave to you. And Lord, we give you our lives anew today and those who... uh, We've never received you. Friend, I just want you to right now just say, Lord, come into my life. I receive your gift of grace, your forgiveness. I give you my life. What else can I do? And so, Lord, over these next couple of weeks, we commit ourselves to you to focus in, to reflect, to worship, and to love others as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.